Wonderful. Got it. Okay, can everybody see my screen that says Why Transylvania? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Right, great. So I will um I will dive right in and again, you know, either stop me to ask questions or stop me to say you already know all this and, and I can go faster. Um so some of this early material I actually pulled out, I had um presented to the group that was going to Transylvania. I think it was before you guys went in two thousand six was when I put together part of this information. So and then I dove into like what kind of plugs you guys need to bring and stuff like that. So I, I took all that out because we don't care right now. Um, but but some of the background, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps we do mm -hmm. care. So, so this was what I put together is, you know, a little bit of historical stuff, what's going on today, some some pictures and then and then what's next, you know, talking about the the the, the visitors in May. Um, so, you know, first of all, just a little uh, refresher or introduction to the geography. So all this, this is, you know, part of Europe, all this used to be Hungary before World War I. This is still referred to in that region as Greater Hungary. <clears throat> Today, this, just this little white thing is Hungary. <sighs> And so that is also, if people are talking in historical terms, sometimes called Lesser Hungary. And that's what it actually says here in Hungarian. It says Kis Magyarország, which means Little Hungary or Lesser Hungary. And all this gray part, which got chopped off, is called Erde in Hungarian, which if you translate that into Latin, it means beyond the woods, which which is Transylvania. So the the English term yeah. for the for the region is is its Latin name. And at the time, it was the French and the English who got together and decided to chop up Europe. And so this part ended up in Ukraine. So they're not too happy right now. Um, this part ended up in Slovakia. This part ended up in Austria. This part ended up in Serbia. No, sorry. This part ended up in Croatia, and this part ended up in Serbia. <laughs> so, and people went and they gave presentations to the British and the French and like about culture and cultural heritage and linguistic groups and how this was a terrible idea and gave all sorts of alternatives. Nope, this is what they did. And it's kind of been a problem ever since. You know, some sometimes it's been more of a problem, and sometimes it's been less of a problem. But it's it's been a problem ever since. Um, so our partner church is about there. You know, sort of sort of centralish, a little bit east. You know, but just by by way of um, of uh, reference, I don't know if Lillian's still here, but but Concord's partner church is further east. And interestingly enough, the further east you go, the easier time the Hungarians have, because they're far from sort of the seat of Romanian government. And so the further east you go, um, the less discriminated they are, again, you know, the, the, the less prejudice they suffer, the less discrimination they suffer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our partner church is in a place where if you're an ethnic Hungarian, you still have a pretty hard time. Um, and I'll also mention that our newish minister, he's been there about the same length Chris has been our minister here, comes from the ch church that is Concord's partner church. That's his home church. That's where he grew up. As a result, he speaks zero Romanian. And he didn't even know that that was going to be a problem. Hmm. So he moved, you know, he moved west with his new wife, his young, you know, young family, and oh my God, he can't get anything done. Because he doesn't, you know, he, he studied it in school, everybody has to study it in school, but that's like us taking French or Spanish in school. It doesn't mean we can go to the city hall and converse. Right. And so Lutzi, the, our visitor, who's the parish board president, will be coming in May, and he's been to Belmont before, he takes him everywhere. You know, he already looks like he's 12 years old and he can't speak the language. So it's it's been an interesting experience for him. But that that's something I learned last summer. I did not realize that the people this far east do not speak Romanian because they don't have to. Well, that was that, that was new to me. 
So a, a little bit about names, you know, if you look at maps or even if you look at people, <clears throat> all the all the old Hungarian cities and villages, so basically everything in here, um, has two names, the old, the original Hungarian name, and this is what everybody who lives there uses. And then the official name that appears on all the maps and the signs and official documents, which you only use or they only use it if they have to, you know, in official circumstances. So for example, when we write a letter of invitation to our partners and we write to the US Embassy, we must use Dej, which is the Romanian name and not Dejvalva, which is the Hungarian name. And even people have two names. So they have their actual name, and then they have their the Romanian translation of their name that they have to use on all the official documents. And sometimes they're even their last name gets spelled differently as a result of that. So everybody has to deal with this dichotomy. And what I another thing I learned this summer, and I actually learned it from Lotzi, who who will be visiting us. He's a very uh, well informed uh, gentleman. Um, he explained about gerrymandering Romanian style, because we talked about gerrymandering and you know what happens here and, and all that. And he and so since Romania is part of the European Union, um, mandatory bilingual signage is 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 law, provided that at least twenty percent of your population is whatever you know whatever it is, and then you're supposed to use put out all signage in that other language in addition to your primary language. So this is true in every country. So what the Romanians have done, according to Lotzi, is they've redrawn the county lines so that that 20% is never met hmm. until you get far enough east that there are no more Romanians. So they don't really have a choice. So, so suddenly, if you're traveling in Romania, you go far enough east, suddenly all the signs switch to Hungarian. But even further west, a majority of the population in many cases is Hungarian, but there are always Romanian villages or Romanian cities mixed in. And so they're able to draw the districts. They've optimized it to have as little Hungarian signage as they possibly can. So there's all these little, you know, I'll call them microaggressions, which is still better than the macroaggressions that happened, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But still, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, so, so how did this all start and why, which again, maybe you all know, um, so I'll, I'll do this quickly, but. You know, I appreciate hearing it. Okay. Well, Nicolae Ceausescu mm -hmm. was the secretary general of the Romanian Communist Party for a long time. And, um, this had of course already all happened because this is all the country got carved up after World War I. And he basically systematically tried to um, exterminate not just the Hungarians, but also the Roma and any other minorities that, that lived there. Um, and, and, you know, some of the specific things we heard about from our partners is people got beaten, they were abducted, um, they disappeared without a trace they would not be able to get jobs you know they open their mouths and if they had a hungarian accent even if they spoke perfect romanian forget it um hungarian was not allowed the hungarian flag was not is not allowed to be flown outdoors can only be flown indoors in our church for example in the deshwal church it's flown indoors um but in seca kerestud it's flown outdoors because that's far enough east that no one looks <laughs> over there <laughs> <laughs> so did Romania, that whole area was Hungary. Did yeah. Romania existed in one section. There's more. Um, so that this map that I showed was all Hungary. Yeah. There, right. there is a chunk that I didn't show that was always Romania, just okay. like the rest of Ukraine and the less rest of okay. Slovakia and the rest of. So imagine you took a hole punch, you know, that was bigger than Hungary and you just took a big hole out of the middle and then all the little pieces got got annexed so did, to all the neighbors. Was countries. Romania then made larger? I'm yeah, just wondering. It yeah. was made larger by by over 50%. Okay. Oh, so that's significant. Okay, Huge, wow. Hugely. Okay. Yeah. 50%. Okay. Yeah. Well, Olivia, I, I have know. a question. That, what I'm not quite understanding is, is it sounds as if if they're further east, that's 
near the majority of Romania. I know. It's weird. It's backwards. Oh, so it is backwards. It's okay, backwards from what it's, okay. it's backwards from what I would have expected. And yeah. and part of part of you know, I would have never noticed because every other time I've been there, I took a plane and I like every all of us and we landed in Kolojvar and we were plopped in there. This time, um, this past summer, um, my family t took vacation to Italy and we happened to, you know, we got invited to Chongor and Emeka's wedding and, and we said, oh, well, you know, we can do it. And we decided to drive. And that was when we were, because we had to stop multiple times across the country because they were way, way east. Right. And we stopped and we stopped right on the Hungarian border. We drove, we drove across Hungary and then we, we went into Romania and we stopped at a hotel. And that was a very famous old Hungarian city of Temesvar. And there were zero Hungarians, zero Hungarian signage. You know, not, uh, even, even when there was signage in English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, no Hungarian. Wow. And I was like, what on earth? And then as we were driving further and further east, um, there was still no signage. But for example, there, were, there was a lot of construction going on on the highway. And like, I really needed to find a restroom. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, so there, it looked like there was a rest stop. And so we pulled off, but then we realized the rest stop was under construction. So there was no, there was no, you know, no facilities. And um, a couple of the construction workers came over and we happened to have a car. We had a car with Hungarian plates. Our rental car had Hungarian plates and people would look at us and they'd sort of, you know, frown. And then they noticed our plates and the big smile wave and then immediately telling us in Hungarian, oh, this is under construction. There's no bathrooms, blah, 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 blah. And, and so all along, as we drove along and we drove through towns and villages, we got this reaction and we heard Hungarian being spoken, but more and more and more as we went east. And then when we were at Chongor's wedding, I was chatting with Lotzi and he explained that near the Hungarian border, they made an extra effort to kill off and assimilate the Hungarians as much as they could. And wow. the further they got from the border, the less they cared. Huh. And he also said that that now, um, Sekaifeld, which is, you know, it's, it's a nickname, the land of the, the, the Sacklers, which is the old, old Hungarians, East, they actually recruit Hungarians from the Western regions for jobs and and for, for to live there by enticing them and saying, "Hey, it's better here. It, it's it's a better life. Right. It, it, you know, more more opportunities, etc." And people go, so it's a little bit self fulfilling, in 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 that the Hungarians are migrating east, even if they didn't start out there. Wow. Libby, do you know understand the politics of why Romania was, you know, increased by fifty percent? I mean, that's sort of an interesting. Well, because Hungary was on the wrong side in World War One, so it was a punishment. Ah, uh, okay, got it. Right. Yep. Yep. They were always on the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yep, I mean, so they... the people, the people can't help it, but the government's terrible. The current government's terrible too. So it's nothing, nothing, nothing new. Um, okay. So, uh, so, so, so interestingly though, that part of Hungary, that big giant chunk of Hungary um, that was, that became part of Romania, they have always been Unitarian ah. like, for 600 years or whatever whatever the number is now they've always been unitarian and there there's history books about how they became unitarian they became unitarian during the ottoman empire and they've been unitarian ever since and for that reason the uua paid attention to what was going on right that that was what sort of they're like hey wait a second these people are being killed I mean, maybe they would have paid attention anyway, but the fact that they were Unitarians, you know, really sort of made them take mm. it. And so, in fact, this city of Temeshvar, the one where I mentioned we stopped at a hotel where there was no Hungarian 
signage, even though there were four or five other languages, every, everywhere was, was multilingual, but not Hungarian. Well, maybe that wasn't an accident because this was where the revolution started against Ceausescu. That was the city. So in 1989, there was a prominent Unitarian minister who just, he was, he was fired. And I mean, that kind of thing happened all the time. Um, but in this particular case, there was a huge demonstration as a result of him being fired. And, and it started up a big, you know, it, 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 was, start, it, it was a bloody revolution. Um, Ceausescu and his wife were executed by the mob, basically, via firing squad. So, it, Olivia, I have a question. Did that, epi did that firing and the re revolt start before or after the uh, Velvet Revolution in, in the Czech Republic? Because it was the same year. It was, yeah, I don't know exactly, but I do know that while one of them was very peaceful, yes. this was, this was the only what was very bloody. Yes, no, I do and, know that. But I was wondering whether um, some of the people of Temeshvar uh, sort of got inspiration by other elements it's, of it's, the- uh, Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot of things happened around the same time and they all kind of knew about each other. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's likely, um, but it's interesting that it was a Unitarian minister's firing mm -hmm. that usually that part you don't hear in the news or you don't read about in in the history books necessarily. But I, it's interesting for us, you know, yeah. that, that, that that's what sparked it. Um, and it was really at that time. So Bill Schultz was the president of the UUA at the time. And this is a quote from him that I had gotten from Doris Hunter, um, who was our interim minister that, that many of you, probably most of you probably remember. And she was friends with Bill Schultz and she was big into the, the UUPCC movement. And so this was a quote from, from Bill Schultz. And um, at the time they were called sister churches, I guess. At some point, I'm not sure when, they changed that to a, a less, less gendered term of, of partner church. Um, so what about First Church? Well, First Church was one of the first, if not the first, I'm not sure, um, to volunteer to become um, a quote unquote sister church in 1990. And I do know that Hans de Kaiser apparently just got on a plane and went to the village on his own the first time with a bottle of wine. I mean, this is the story I heard from, from the other side, you know, from the villagers, was this man showed up got off the, the, the bus and showed up with a bottle of wine and went, across, went down that dirt road, that main dirt road in the village and just sang at the top of his lungs. And um, they're like, who is this person? <laughs> and um, they, you know, he made himself understood. He spoke other languages and they spoke other languages and they communicated and became friends. He became friends with um, Balint Ben Sidi Ferenc who, later became the bishop. He was the minister in Deshval at the time. And they became good friends. And then after Hans, I don't, I'm a little fuzzy about the timing because when, if you talk to Alpha, you get a different story than if you talk to B. And so some of our history is a little bit off. But, um, but somewhere soon thereafter, Alpha followed with a choir in-, in No. The, no? I don't think Is so. that right? There wasn't a choir. Okay. Well, well that's good to know. Diane and Charles, yeah. the wonderful woman who was a, oh, damn. Uh, I know who you're talking Ellen? about. Ellen? Ellen Sarasuelo. Yeah, and Ellen Sarasuelo. Sarasuelo, yeah. And Charles. And Charles Thomas. Okay. okay. I lost my slides. Where'd they go? Yeah. yeah. Where are they? They went into the zoomosphere. They were so good though. They're coming back. I can, they will come back. Okay. I have to find them. Yeah, so they went, the four of them went. Right. Uh, and I think. Oh, I see. They're behind, you are, you're you right. They're behind my zoom window. <laughs> Where'd they go? Where'd they go? All right, I'm gonna have to minimize my zoom window for a second so I can get at them. Here they are. What are they? What did that happen? 
And at that point, when they went, there was one car belonged to the doctor in town, maybe two. And there was like one phone again, belonged to the doctor. Um, yeah, it was pretty. So now I don't see any of you. <laughs> this is well, I can see all of you. That's good. I can't see any of you. <clears throat> you all. Must be. I just want to mention that this is so good. We have to find another venue so a lot of people can see it. <laughs> market it a little different or something. Yeah, well, we didn't we didn't really market it. Um, okay. Can you guys see it, it again? Great presentation. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I still can't see any of you. That's the only sad part. Okay, well, Alpha followed. That's true. Um, okay. No plan. So um, so <laughs> Sherry and, and Victor Carpenter and many other people. And so we heard a story, and, and some of you may remember this story. Boy, I really wish I could see you again. What happened to all of you? This is very strange. Under participants or? Hugging me. Yeah, yeah. no, that just a, gives me a list. Is there or a little blue. camera, a little blue camera or a little blue? No, no, somewhere there's a- uh, How about view at the top of your screen? I'm looking for, well, see, I don't even have that. I don't even have that. All I have is that bar. I don't have a Zoom window at all. Oh. Which yeah, is the Zoom bar. bar. It's really very strange. Anyway, more. Do you have few options at the top view? No, uh, no, I know where that's supposed to be, and I don't have that. I have nothing. All I have is that little bar. <laughs> well, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not gonna wait, wait, wait. Oh, I think I might have seen where it went. <laughs> it was at the, it was like squished down at the bottom left of my screen, which has never happened. Okay, I see you all again. Oh, all right. So, so just kind of a fun story that we heard about Victor Carpenter when we were there. So, some of you may recognize this is in Kolozhvar. Yep. This is the big church in Kolozhvar, and this is the the statue of King of King Matyash. Mm -hmm. Hungarian, very famous Hungarian king that's sort of revered in, in, in Hungary. And he was Transylvanian. And um, the Romanian government started an archaeological dig right there, right there in front of that statue. And they were basically digging a hole and the statue started to fall over. And, and, you know, rumor had it that the whole reason they were doing it right there was so that they, this, oops, this famous Hungarian king statue would fall over. And Victor Carpenter found out about this and he went to the city hall in Kolozhvar. And this is the, you know, the old capital of Transylvania. This is a big city. And he went to city hall and he apparently yelled at them and cussed them out and told them they need to stop and that they and he did this whole big giant production and they actually stopped <laughs> and so there's a little glassed over beginning of an you some of you may remember a little yep. Yep. bit of an archaeological dig right there that they didn't continue <laughs> thanks to victor carpenter whoa yeah so they he's you know, he's a legend over there as a, as a result of this because he saved <laughs> he saved the statue of their king. So moving moving you know jumping ahead right. So Ceausescu was killed. Partner church movement began and and in general they started doing better. I and mean, they were very very um, backward and behind in those early days. And you know every, many of you know who were involved then. I mean I wasn't involved then many of you know and you know just an, an example that i heard was um you know they wanted medical supplies and dental supplies people really weren't keeping up on dental hygiene no nope. one of the things that they asked for was dental floss but then shando the the previous minister explained that when they got the dental floss they used it to slice their cheese <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what do I need this for? I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to yeah, try that. Yeah, yes. I guess it, I guess actually, it. I I do that. I I slice different kinds of cheese, brie cheese, yeah, soft cheese, soft. right? Right. Yeah. Goat cheese slices. Goat beautiful. cheese. Remember <laughs> the big sheep cheese? Some of you might remember that 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 kind. <laughs> they would slice with the, the, the flavored floss. 
think so. No, not the mint. I think it was just plain. Um, but Sandor and Tunde uh, made a big thing of their kids brushing their teeth. Yeah. yeah. I remember them telling me that, yeah. that that was like a ritual at night that to have gotten yeah. toothbrushes well, in the face was a big deal. Yeah. Right. What I remember when um, Shandor and Tunde came, uh, getting yeah. um, dental work done was always yeah. part of their visit to yeah. this country. And in particular, um, Tunde was very upset about the condition of her teeth. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of a lot of that has really changed. Um, you know, these are some some still a little bit older, but but you know, recent UUPCC mission mission statements. I should add, the UUPCC as an entity no longer exists. Right. Um, it's been sort of absorbed into the UUA International Office, I guess. And you know, maybe Lillian, you know more than I do, but um, unfortunately, I won't be able to join that call because I have major music rehearsal. Darn it! <laughs> oh, that that's that's too bad. I hope some of these maybe it gets recorded. I'm really curious to know what they're going to do. Actually, you know how the program's going to going to be run. Well, I think there's some more hope now that um, uh, Reverend Morgan McLean is officially uh, the. Uh, staff person at the UUA um, uh, um, in the international office, and they they seem to have picked up the ball pretty well. They're they're helping people with travel arrangements. Um, they're providing resources, and I don't know where it's going to go. You know, financially, how the yeah. UUPC was structured, but I do see that there's um, uh, some interest in continuing to support uh, the partnership in Transylvania. Yeah, I definitely got the sense that they want to continue to support it and that there are people, there are certainly ministers who would lead it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not totally clear on why they dissolved the office unless it was financial. Was it, was it primarily financial? It was complicated because the, uh, the structure, it was, it, you know, there are three organizations, the UUA, the UUPCC, and the, inter, the European International Section. And it, it just wasn't working because they were, they had, they weren't coordinating. In they a had way. kind of overlapping responsibility. Overlapping, right. And yeah. as the partnerships grew to different places, including India and, you know, yeah. other places around the world, it, it became... Uh, I think untenuous. And so restructuring is not a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so there's a, so there's a big community call on Thursday night that I wanted to call into only to find out that Ian scheduled major music rehearsal that night. So I can't go. <laughs> well, I think people, anyone who comes uh, will learn a great deal because yeah. there'll be representatives from Morgan McLean will be there, but um, John Gibbons, who has been there 25 times and has just come back from Transylvania. John, John is John is uh, coming to our Hungarian school every. He's been coming regularly to to study Hungarian. Yeah, it's been great. And the point of it is to to trade information among partnerships, so that mm -hmm. you know people know who's traveling, who's coming here. Yep. Um, what can you learn from each other? And of course, addressing the situation of. Uh, the significant uh, tie to Viktor Orban and and um, you know what's going on in Transylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit more specifically, you know, moving to First Church. This is a lot of words, but I, you know, again, I wanted to get it down here in the interest of just having a record. This is the vision and mission statement that we came up with some number of years ago, um, you know, four four or five years ago or so. And I think it's pretty good. You know, I think the, the main the main portions of our mission are are highlighted, you know, scholarships, personal relationships, pilgrimage, and essentially culture, cultural things. And I think we do a pretty good job of um, keeping those alive, even even though we've had a pandemic and we've had it's been a long time since we've we've visited in person really in an organized way. Um, I always I'm always interested in this particular, this was an article now a long time ago in UU Worlds by Gretchen Thomas in 2010. And it really struck me because in people who've been there can, can agree or disagree, but usually when people come back, they end up with a much deeper appreciation of the relationship 
and they feel like the elements of community and spirituality and you know prioritizing the things that really matter um that they may do a better job of that than we do even though they're poor you know the, from a material standpoint they're much much poorer than we are and you know gretchen thomas wrote this very thought-provoking article about um why we have a partnership and 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 often our transylvanian partners will ask us this question that what do we get out of it because they get more concrete benefits right we support a scholarship program we give them some financial support but we get arguably more abstract benefits from it uh, more spiritual benefits and, you know and how we can get a copy of that article I, I guess I would just search for it online. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's probably findable. Okay, I'll look. Um, but this bottom point is one that I find myself having to make because it's also a reminder to myself that we're so it's so ingrained in us here in the United States because of the way public schools are funded. They're funded from property tax, and. Mm -hmm. By definition, when schools are funded from property taxes, you have inequality in education, and it correlates with wealth, which is actually really kind of a terrible system if you think about it. Um, in Europe, it doesn't work that way. Schools are funded not by property taxes, or not by yeah, and not by not by property taxes, not by income taxes, um, and as a result. Um, education level and income level are not correlated and i find myself um i mean i speak if i'm in hungary or or italy or france or um but you know particularly further east i find myself i catch myself being surprised when a cab driver or a grocery bagger will start an erudite, erudite conversation with me and I'm like oh and then I catch myself and go oh yeah yeah right there's no correlation between poverty and education mm -hmm. and this is very very true of our partners yes. and it's, it's, I think it's important to not forget that yeah but we have to fund them to go to, to you know they would have to travel I mean they might not get that education that's right that's true yeah so so in our village it's it's more true right but i i guess i'm referring to in, 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 a, city, in a city or incidental travels right um and and unitarians they're actually put a lot of emphasis on education so they'll they'll go to great lengths to try to get an education you know we are helping this one village to do that but they try um let's see what else do i have so okay so then i have i just put in some pictures some of you may recognize these and those of you who haven't been there as, you, as we drive up the road to get to the village this is the first thing we see um, this is actually a joint this is a shared hay field that the that people in the village um you know use and distribute among their animals and they have all their sheep here and uh, the um there's another minister there the uh the reformed church minister is the shepherd so he watches everybody's sheep you know. um and all over the place there are these carved wooden gates so that is a that is a characteristic of transylvania that you will not see in other parts of hungary or you know old or old or new hungary this is very transylvanian these carved wooden gates everywhere um, that's what our village looks like from as you're driving along the road, and that's the first glimpse. There's the church. Olivia, what's the village across the valley? That is, I believe that's Horonglab. Yeah, I think so That's so. that other little tiny village that we also visited where... Um, yeah, I think it is Horonglab. Yeah. Because it looks like the picture is taken maybe up near where the cemetery is. Yeah, it, this is yeah. from the cemetery. Yeah. yeah. Um, this was the group of us who went in 2010. 
except for Ed, who took the okay. picture. <laughs> So Ed's not in the picture, and my kids are very tiny then. And Hannah's in college, and Emma's in Emma's a sophomore in high school. Oh my God! Well, I, I remember my uncle so Otto's well. still alive. He looks yeah. he looks basically the same. He's ninety six now. Awesome. Yeah, and unfortunately, my dad, who was his younger brother, just passed away in February. Can I can I tell the funny story about uh, when we were there um, before that when? Um, the we went to have a meal served by some oh yes the church and uh otto was was coming up to, you know to get served and the women said in hungarian look at that old fart and, uh, <laughs> and, and livia said turned to them and said that old fart speaks hungarian, speaks hungarian. <laughs> They were so embarrassed. They were, <laughs> you know, then they all surrounded him and they were trying to be really oh, nice oh, oh, and they were being, oh my God, they were so embarrassed. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, this part of my presentation wants to advance on its own. I don't know why, but anyway, it's doing it. So that was us. Um, these were also from that trip. This is the, um, you know, David Ferenc or Francis David, the rock that he stood on and supposedly converted everybody in, in Kolozhvar after the Edict of Torda. And uh, I remember the bishop telling us this story, and I think he doubted both the rock and the story. He's like, it's just some rock. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was kind of fun because uh, they're, you know, they're very famous for, for boyai or non-Euclidean geometry in Kolozhvar and even the pizza, the pizza box, I wish this would stop doing it, sorry about that. The pizza box was named after uh, the mathematician. Ah. Um, and we saw, this was the hood of someone's car. This was uh, Joel Choimoshi, he's a minister now and he takes his youth group on this very long bike trip every year, 987 miles. And so this is painted on the, the hood of his car. <clears throat> this was the Torda Gorge, so the scenery is really oh, beautiful. Right. Now there's a house, so you can see how big the thing is. Um, this was the church at which the Edict of Torda was proclaimed. That was fun to see. And then these are pictures of Dej Falva again. This is the inside of the church, the outside of the church, the village. And these kids are probably in college by now. Well, you realize how much work they've done on the church. Yeah. Yeah. This is before they fixed the roof. And the inside, and too. The, insi the inside, too. Yeah. This was, these pictures are amazing. It's Kathy with B. When B, this was the first time she ever saw the memorial that they carved in memory of Hans. And they were dedicating it. That. They dedicated it. That's right. Oh my God, this is so irritating. I really <coughs> it won't stop. <clears throat> and then, uh, night. We had neither of these ministers are in the, these roles anymore. Right? This is Shandor and David in the pulpit and Deshvala. Um, and then this was also a fun story. So we had some visitors here in 2013, um, the San Giorgis, who were the, the minister's family, and they stopped in to watch one of Alpha's musical rehearsals. And then they, you know, they came out, they were fascinated by it. She was there with all the little kids and the, you know, all the different age groups like she, like she used to do. And so we had a long conversation about music education and the opportunities in the village and the lack thereof. And um, that, together with Concord's successful model of fellowship through these, you know, through choir trips and through Alpha's intergenerational choir trip that she did in 2006, that planted the seeds for the 2016 trip, which was a essentially a recorder clinic in Deshvala. So you see, here's Ian now, and there's Chuck, and there's me, and it was so hot. Do you guys uh. remember how hot it was? <laughs> It was super, super hot. Super and then hot. Those, those who weren't involved in um, in the music camp, like Eleanor and Jean, went on visits to, um, went, you guys went on home visits, right? And, I, yeah. and that was also a really, really moving experience. Yeah, there, there are two people who were more or less shut in and old and sick and um, 
we were able to um, deliver them some funds. Um, the, the individual people were, were selected by um, Shandor. Mm -hmm. and, and the group of us would go and visit the people and sit and talk with them. We had a translator with us, so it was good. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, the rest of us were sweating like crazy, you know, so we, we had we were sometimes we were with the whole group and other times we pulled the group apart into smaller, smaller groups to work on different parts. And it was great. It was really a lot of fun. Um, you know, Chuck and Ian did a fabulous job, even though they didn't speak the language. And it was, you know, another another funny story. Chuck was just fuming the whole time because all the teenage girls were fawning all over Ian. And they were just they were just like and they're like did everything he would tell them but they wouldn't listen to either their own music teacher who was really irritated or chuck so they were the two of them were just really irritated the whole time <laughs> by the fact that that all the girls were, <laughs> were like flocking around Ian. so it was pretty funny he was he was like a pied piper he was he was so it was fun um and then afterwards they took us that's right this was this was um between dinner and dessert we were extremely full and the women were making fresh uh donuts and they weren't ready and they told us to go away for a while and so they took us up on the hillside again where they keep the sheep and they make the cheese and uh so here a whole bunch of kids ours and theirs there's molly molly calkins mm -hmm. and um Emma. Yeah, Emma. and Emma. And uh and there's there you are, Eleanor. And it was really hot, but they still put on these extremely furry things, which is their winter gear, you know, up on the hillside when they're when they're watching the sheep. So this is Emma and this is I can't tell who, but it's one of oh, I think it's I think it's Rebecca. It's mm -hmm. the two of them. That was a riot that visit. Yeah. And this is um this is Balint. This is um um i'm blanking on her name but well, um, uh, she's she has also been to belmont before yeah. i should know because i'm actually good friends with her but i'm blanking on her but anyway it's her son and he's catching the donkeys obviously um and then we performed what we learned in church so here's everybody and you see this gentleman here with the big with the big facial tumor he's one of the people who's going to be coming um, he's their music teacher <clears throat> and, and organist Here's Chuck and Ian playing a duet in the balcony, and this is we were presenting each other with gifts in the church. And then I'm then moving on to something that nobody saw. Uh, so this is Chongor and Amuka now. Um, so this is our new minister, the one who looks like he's 12 years old. <laughs> uh, he's fabulous. He's amazing. He's inc incredibly charismatic. It's amazing to see him with you know, with all the very experienced people. And again, he's got this handicap. He doesn't speak Romanian. Um, and he, you know, and he married this beautiful woman, Amuka, she's just beautiful. And my cousin Otto made the snarky comment. He, was, he wasn't he was there yet. He, I was showing him pictures on the way back. And he made the snarky comment. He said, well, he said, Chongor, and they've been to Seged, so they've met them since in person. And he said, he is the embodiment of optimism. And I said, why do you say that? And he says, anybody who looks like that can marry somebody who looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're wonderful. They're really sweet. And again, he's super charismatic, organized, everything else. And it was the time of year when all the storks were on their mm -hmm. nests. So it was yeah. really fun for me. I couldn't stop taking pictures of storks. So I made this little uh, made this little collage of my stork pictures, my best stork pictures. And then um, the only the only pictures I included here. So um, this wedding was in Kishoimosh, which is next to Seikai Kerestur, which is where Chongor grew up. Again, far from Deshvala, you know, several hours away. They got a bus. He invited the entire village of Deshvala to his wedding. <laughs> they got a bus. <laughs> and this, these are all the people from Deshvalva, plus us, who took the bus to come to Chongor's wedding. So fantastic! It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Almost the entire. And notice group. it's it the men and the women. On the that's side. how. Well, that's how the photographer set it up. Yeah. Oh, uh, really? But yeah. even in church. But I mean, in church, curious for the wedding were the men on one side of the women. Yes, they were. Yeah. Yes, they were. Well, it's funny because Chongor told them not to do that. 
Oh, really? He told them, he said, no, well, let everybody sit with their families. And then as soon as he said that, everybody split in half and went on two sides. And he's like, oh, whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he tried. Um, but again, these are the four people who are going to be coming. I have larger pictures of them. So here they are. So this is Lotzi. Um, he's been to Belmont before. This is Lotzi with his two grandchildren. Yeah, and he stayed with Eric and me. Yeah, yeah. So he'll be coming again. Um, and this is Miklos. Mm -hmm. And Jean stayed with Miklos and his family when they were there. So Jean is actually going to be hosting Miklos and Lotzi um, because they wanted, they were a little scared to be by themselves since neither of them speak any English. Um, so Jean, was, Jean and Joel are nice enough to, to volunteer to host bo both of them. And then um, Mishi and Margit. Um, so you, you guys may remember Boroka. She was there. Yeah. And she, in our um, Zoom uh, service, Boroka was the translator on their side. Yeah. And oh, so great. her mom and dad, uh, assuming they can get the visa situation straightened out, will be coming. Right. Which, which I'm excited about because they're really, you know, they're, I think they'll be really good. So they've never been, right? They've they, never been. They've right. never been. Now, so where what is the status of the of the of the v so so, so where are here's the story so now everything is online right so they needed to get a bunch of paperwork from us and they needed to to submit a bunch of paperwork and um you know they they went and they had to click on the thing to get an appointment at the embassy so mishi he's doing all the online stuff so he's like the com computer guy actually he's their old computer teacher back when they had they did computer lessons and english lessons he was the one who who, uh, who taught the kids and um he clicked on it and got like march 14th it was like great but then they were missing something from us they still needed another piece of documentation from us so he had to exit out and then he got the piece of documentation from us went back in and the earliest date, this was like three hours later, the earliest date that came up was July 20th. Oh, shit. Like, that's oh. not going to work. And so Chongor messaged me. He's like, we have a problem. Here's what's going on. What do you, what do you suggest? And so I went online and I said, there is an option to choose an, an emergency, you know, basically an exception to get an earlier time as long as it's at least 10 weeks before the planned trip, which it was, you know, was, we're well within the 10 weeks. And um, actually it was eight weeks and we were, we were like at 11 weeks or something. And so he, he clicked on that and requested a March date. And that's where we currently stand. They're waiting for a response. And if that gets denied, um, yeah. then, you know, we'll have to try to, call the embassy or try to get them all they need is an earlier interview date and so if if they don't get an earlier interview date then Lutzi is the only person who can come um Livia, i have a question what's baroka doing now Bar she's in college yeah in she's, where in uh, um she's in she is in Kolozhvar, but she was she's in an exchange program in london right now actually oh, good 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 and she's studying um, international relations, and she's studying English and French and German, and she's she's gotten quite good. Yeah, she was a real star. I remember her from yeah when we were there. Yeah. Well, so but the interview is there anything that's contingent on the interview, or or is that just is that just sort of um, pro forma stuff? I mean, no, it's not at all pro forma. That was. That, but that's even if the thing the that decides whether they can get a visa or not. All right. So that so even if they get the date, the, the interview doesn't is something, mean I mean, what could come up in the, you know, interview that, you know, would um, could be things, an things like they don't believe they're that they they think they're a defection risk. Oh yeah, right. Right? I mean, this is the US we're talking about, right? This is the US embassy. I mean, I think it helps a lot. You know, the letter I wrote and the letter Lori Graham signed um, talks about the fact that we've had an unblemished record over 33 years, enumerating all the visits and all the people who've come, none of whom have ever tried to stay. And all of these people have families at home and obligations right. at home and everything else. So, you know, we did the best we could. I think we made a pretty good case. I mean, we have an unblemished record over 33 years. 
So, but, but they actually and, have to get a date. But so, but you th with um, Nisi and, and Marguerite, I mean, they have they have children. Well, Boroka's, but she's you know her kid. Their kids are kind of grown, so that that's a risk I think for them. Oh, okay. So that all right. So oh, sorry. That's right. That so the. So they're grown kids. So the, the reason that the minister couldn't come is that as a as a young married couple without children, they would be seen as a higher risk. Well, the, the reason had, the minister couldn't come, there are two reasons. So so first of all, most pe most people are not vaccinated against COVID oh, right. in, in the village because they they had one case or something, or they just it's the rural that just isn't really a thing. Um. <clears throat> The other is that their coming of age service is a really big deal. Oh, right. And so, and Chongo said that they already, they moved, they moved the coming of age service last year for some reason. And he said it was like this huge uproar. People got really upset that they moved the date. Right. And he would have to move it again. Oh dear. You know, he was willing to go get vaccinated. But he said he would have to move it again. And and he already he got in so much trouble moving it once, and to move it two years in a row on short notice was not something that he thought he could do. Yep. Because apparently people travel in, you know, extended relatives coming. It's it's I mean it's a big deal for us too, but it's a much bigger deal in their church. Um so we do have we've started a little bit this is this is an example from the last time we had a visit um of how we put together events and this wasn't the final because we were at the time still looking for volunteers and we we put together this itinerary over over their stay we'll do something similar this time except not as crowded one of one of the lessons we learned was we overscheduled people they were exhausted so we will probably not have more than one thing a day and we'll probably have a couple of just totally down days too but this is the sort of thing we'll do um you know we'll kick this into gear but i don't want to really spend tons of time until we have a little better idea whether they get a, a hearing date for their visa do you have how long that will take to for, to find out well, they have to they have to get it by the middle of march or they're out outside the window well yeah so i'm just curious to know how how long it takes to hear back on the hearing well, they've got I, I i don't know that's we can't wait yeah. too much longer so that's it's a little bit up in the air but um i hope we'll know a lot more soon okay um, but it was super frustrating because he was he had March 14th. Yeah. He had to X out because he was missing something. And then like almost immediately thereafter, it was all booked. And then that, that's right. Then he said the system crashed. So he was hoping when he went back in the next day that March would be an option again. But it was never an option again. He tried a bunch of times. Oh, my God. Yeah. And... um. Do we have any sense? Oh well, well, we don't need to get it into now because we've got auction, auction night, whatever. We'll have to figure that so out. So auction night, Sherry and Ralph Jones are not coming to the auction, and they oh. would like to host the visitors for dinner that night. So that okay. that is actually fantastic. Okay. So so just for everybody's benefit, um, after discussing with a number of people, we didn't think that inviting them to the auction would be that no. great an idea. No. Um, for first of all, it they would just be getting here, so they would be exhausted, and and it would also be we they wouldn't they wouldn't have really gotten to know us yet, <laughs> and that would be a really weird, um, yeah, ostentatious weird. display of wealth right away, which yeah. I didn't think would was quite the right <laughs> message to send. You know, I think if it had been at the end, you know, maybe I would think differently. If it was at the end of their visit um but right at the beginning it didn't seem like a great idea no um but anyway uh ralph and sherry were thrilled to be able to help so so that so that part we have and we have a few other good ideas but um 
But again, I think I think I'll probably hold off really nailing things down um, for another week or so, um, because I I'd hate to sort of get everybody spun up and then they oop they can't come. So. Yeah. So that's all. That's what I had prepared. Um, you know, thank you, thank you all for coming. You know, I I wish we had gotten some completely new people, but we didn't. And uh, yeah, I would be happy. I would certainly be happy to do something like this again in 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 a different format if we marketed it or advertised it a little bit more. Yeah, it's good. So, Livia, if if so, Lotsi will come by himself if if the others we, don't. We haven't we haven't discussed that. I yeah. I suspect he would he would. And but, I would say your place then at that point to be yeah, able, yeah. sure sure okay. yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to get out of it, but it seems to make more sense from a language, yes. thing, right? Again, we we haven't gone there because we don't, you know. We Does don't that impact the we, applications? Because I know they had to give addresses. So if they mm -hmm. come, oh, that's right, they don't get their visa, whatever. Yeah, I mean, no one's gonna. No, the police aren't coming around checking about where who's. Well, Lotsi already has his because he travels to to England all the time because his daughter lives lives oh, okay. in London. So he's fine. Nobody's going to okay. pay any attention to him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I, I, as I say, I don't think we're going to have, uh, you know, anyone, you know, doing bedroom checks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. But um, yeah, I mean, it is the United States that makes makes this difficult. It's not Romania. I, you know, people often think it's the Romanian government. They're like, no, it's us. It's actually it's, just us. It's <laughs> West making it difficult. It's oh. yeah. It's the U.S. Yes, it's the U.S. Yeah, and if we, if you had any in in the State Department, well, that's what I'm just wondering. So can't we? I, I feel like saying, "Hey, David D, is there any way?" That, you yeah, know, I know he's left, but <laughs> yeah. Well, back when when we had Senator Kennedy, he was very helpful. Yeah. We had to call on him before, and he was extremely helpful. Well, but this is we part had... of constituent services. Uh, all right. So Elizabeth Warren. I mean, you know, yeah. if I mean, they don't, I, I would say if they don't hear in a week. Yep. Anything, or they get denied uh, a timely appointment. That would be the time to think about somebody in government to call. Okay, yeah. so we've got, so is that, you know, are we talking about a senator or Elizabeth, you know? Who yeah, or, that's, or, that's what we're talking about, because that's a consti constituent services. I mean, I probably would have started just because I know him with Will Brownsberger and ask his advice and figure out what to well, do. Well, so, yeah, Elizabeth uh, so Catherine, I mean, so either either or that or, or Catherine. Um, or Catherine Clark. Clark. Catherine Clark. Yeah. Catherine Clark. Well, yeah. so here's the question. Here, here, oh, I'm just going to tell you right now. So I'm up in. I, I'm actually up in New Hampshire with Will and Carolyn Brownsberger. So the, there you go. at this very moment. Oh, right the, now? I, yes, I had I had to excuse. Well, good. You could ask him what we should do. So, well, right. So the first thing I'm going to tell him is about gerrymandering. He's going to get. We are just, you know, because we were talking, you know. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get a kick out of that. Yeah. But so seriously. Um, yep. You know, people don't like, uh, so clearly he can pick up the phone and call Catherine Clark and clearly can pick up the phone and call, Ka you know, um, mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren, um, yeah. you know, but what, if, if, and when. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think, I think we give it, we give it a week and then we. So what did, so you had to, just so I could be clear here um, with him. So, so what did, did Senator Kennedy um, help you know, sort of grease the wheels on something. What type of thing are we talking about? Like, so gee, can at, you pull the at the time, at the time, of course, nothing was online. So uh, at the at the time, it was people's visa um, um, applications were denied. They didn't get an explanation, and so we okay. requested, "Hey, could you know, could you find out what happened here? Could you perhaps reconsider this? It's it's church. It, they're not going to defect." it's a, here's the store you know so we so that that kind of thing this is a little different because it's all online now this and is you just, can't jump the yeah so it's sort of like some who yeah it's not like you're gonna mm. yeah but still 
Um, we do have the ambassador's contact information in Bucharest. It's a woman. It's a you know American woman who who's the who's the ambassador, and um, you know if it comes to that, having somebody call the ambassador who is in some form of government here to potentially expedite getting them interviews. Or just find a high school student that can infiltrate the software. Well, yeah. No, yeah. but has that has that happened, Libya? So what I'm saying that No. Is... We're right now he did Mishi did what you're supposed to do, which is he clicked on the request. Right. But have other partner churches so what I'm saying has anyone with this new online system, is, is there an example of- We don't, we don't have an example of okay. either success or failure with this system. That I know, maybe, maybe Lillian, you have some insight. No, I don't. And, and I think because we're now, all of the partners are doing exactly the same thing. They're reaching out and figuring out ways to bring people here or go there. So this is all in the, in the infancy um, stage right now. Um, but, you know, one thing I think I, I hear all of the um, where you are now, Livia, and, you know, you're right, I believe, to hold off, not do anything. But in 10 days or so, if when when the dust settles, if you know that they're coming, then I think putting on the calendar um, informational meeting just like this one for everyone, because you yeah. can then, you can really get excited about the fact that people are coming and yeah. uh, and I'll do whatever I can to help with that and, and publicize it and, you know. Yeah. Thank you, that would be great. Yeah. If, if it gets around to, I mean, I don't know, you know, what we did before, if certain committees are gonna, t you know, take a, a host to do something, because one of the fun things, even though, you know, I, it goes in one ear and out the other, as much as I try is, even just the little Hungarian lesson, just for some basics or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. or the basic, you know, is, yeah. is, yeah. is, um, well, you know. already, um, so I had, I met with Lori Graham. Um, she was really enthusiastic. Um, Ariana Frank and, um, David Deese are both really gung ho. They've already contacted a bunch of committees. Um, so fellowship, social action, music, and I forget who already, um, already said they would they would participate so there's already some good momentum and i have no have doubt actually show up yeah I and you guys no are doubt that you'll be able to make this happen quickly yeah um, and get people on board that yeah. i don't think that's going to be a, a concern yeah. i think the important thing is is then to have in place a date where everybody can get together via zoom or in person i don't know what yep. you want to do but it, mm -hmm. to share what you've done for the presentation because and i learned an enormous amount livia from the presentation it's well oh, good yeah good good yeah i mean i learned i learned a lot of new things just going to chongor and Emuka's wedding because that was a different situation for me you know i every other time i've gone with a group from church and right. it was it was you know, that's that scenario and this time it was just well yes i was representing us and and i and, and i brought a church gift and a church card and all that but it, we were there just as individuals and so the conversations were a little different and the whole thing about driving made made it so different because we got to see really the whole cross section of the country and how it changed as you traveled across it, which was really weird. I mean, I, I was like, I don't understand this. And then Lutzi, again, Lutzi was great because he, he, he explained it all when, because I was sitting next to him at the wedding and I kept interrogating him about it. I'm like, well, why wasn't there any Hungarians? And he's like, oh, so he explained, he explained the whole thing. Transylvania when it says uh, that's on the other side of the the literal translation of that other side of the wood of the forest other, other side of the forest yeah. which is the for is there actually hunger where 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 is that coming yeah from? so so there's the Carpathian Basin which is a which is a big lowland and that's ringed by it was ringed by a huge ancient forest I mean it's still, you know and um and so basically the mount where the mountains start is is Transylvania and and so Hungary in fact there's you know there's a famous uh, Hungarian book by a, a, an award-winning author 
the title is Give Us Back Our Mountains. Oh. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, they, they just chopped off the mountains, and that, that mountainous region is Transylvania. Ah, okay. That's where all the pine trees are, and all the bears. Bruce has oh. a, Bruce got a t-shirt there that that has a bear and a, you know, yeah, it's cute. They're, they have a lot of bears. <laughs> but they're brown well, bears, not black bears. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. So yeah, fingers crossed. You. I will yeah, send fingers, everybody. Fingers, fingers crossed and, um, you know, we'll definitely have to figure something out if they don't hear back. Yeah. Yeah. I will send everybody the link to this forum on, on Thursday. If you can come, please, please join us. At yeah, I hope someone, someone who's not singing in major music, I hope someone can go. Yeah, I hope, John, you'll come. I'll be there. Great, good. Excellent. So hold on. So this, I, I missed the, there's a phone call. I, why did I, I miss yeah. this? It's a, it's a neighboring PCC forum with a lot of important people um, to share information about not only the current situation um, in how the current situation in Hungary is affecting the, our Transylvania partners, um, yeah. And, yeah, but also the Prime Minister of Hungary is, is mini Trump. So was that post was that posted in the Unitarian or did I just completely miss something? No, no, no. I sent it to Livia. Oh, I see. It's it's actually an uh, an invitation to <coughs> all PCCs in the area who want okay. to uh, hear from each other and and share information about are they bringing people? Are they traveling there? Are what's okay. going on with your partnerships? How good is it? Has I was hoping to learn, you know, this whole new structure that with the UUPCC dissolving and kind of where where they're that's going right and we'll hear from Morgan McLean who is the the um, representative at the UUA so I think it'll be interesting and John Givens has a lot to share because he's going to talk about his recent trip there so but they were, is that is that something that's being recorded or just a, a call a, I don't think we will call. record it I'm not okay. sure because it's going to be we're sharing information and I okay got it Okay. All right. Well, I'll, we'll, well if just, anyone's uh, interested, yeah, actually, I mean, Lillian, you have you have the link, right? So, yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm going to say goodbye. You too. I it was a. Um, I'm really glad that I joined you and at Livio. It was a wonderful presentation and a refresher, plus some new bits of information. And I loved the, the photographs of the wedding and hearing about our new minister. And yeah, it was great. Well. Thank you very much for coming. I didn't think anybody was going to show up, so <laughs> no, we did. Somebody. Did. <laughs> it was worth your time. Okay. All right. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.